Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart and our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you for all that you bring forth this night. We will take hold of it, apply it, be doers of it, and it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of possessing a conquering warfare mentality. God wants you to possess a conquering warfare mentality because you are in a spiritual war against spiritual enemies. And you must have that conquering warfare mentality so that you will fight the fight and that you will come out victorious in your life. In 1 Timothy 1.18, he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. He said, you're going to have to war a good warfare if you're going to see these prophecies, these words that have been spoken over you come to pass. Just because we have a promise of God in the word, or because we have a word that's been spoken to us through someone used of the Holy Spirit or spoken to us directly, doesn't mean it's automatically going to come to pass. You are going to have to war a good warfare and fight the fight against the enemy. Well, that means that you and I must get trained up in the ways of spiritual warfare. In 2 Samuel 22, in verse 35, says, He teaches my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. God is teaching you how to engage in spiritual warfare, so you can successfully fight against your enemies and triumph over them. We see over in Joel, in Joel chapter 3, over here in verse 9, he says this, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. God says, prepare war. Mighty men are to wake up. God is at work to wake up the mighty woman and man of God that is in you. And you are going to arise and you are going to become those of war. And you're going to draw nine. You're going to be ready to fight that fight that God has set forth for you and I. Praise God. He's calling every one of us to prepare for war, spiritual war, and engage in it. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Well, this trumpet is giving a clear sound. You are called into the battle. You are to prepare yourself for war, and you are to wake up and become a mighty person in the Lord Jesus Christ and get into the battle. No cl the clear sound is going forth. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. If you are going to be able to pos possess a conquering warfare mentality, you have to know who you are in Christ. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. This is in the response to what the devil considers us, as he considers us sheep for the slaughter. We are not sheep for the slaughter. Instead, we are those who are more than conquerors that are going to conquer the enemy. The enemy would pursue after us, but we are going to pursue the enemy and destroy him and put him underfoot in our life. We see a scripture over in Jeremiah chapter 51. You've got to realize that God is going to use you to fight the battle. Many people out there are just praying and just whatever the Lord wants to do and thinking God's just going to do it independent of us. No. Jeremiah 51, 20, he says, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee, that's with you, will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy the kingdoms. We are binding, loosing, casting down, throwing down, rooting at, driving at, striking at, falling upon to destruction. These evil spirits over the nations in these kingdoms were destroying their works. That's what God wants. You are his battle axe. You are a weapon of war. You got to think about yourself that way. If you just think, well, what's a little old me? How can I do anything? Well, you're not thinking right. You are God's battle axe and weapon of war. And he says, with you, he's going to break in pieces the nations and destroy the kingdoms. Praise God. Well, you've got to know that you have authority. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 19, he says this. 
Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The King James does not do well in this at all. The first word power is a word exousia, which means authority, as Young's literal translation is correct the error. The second word power is dunamis, which truly means power. It is the Greek word for power. It literally says, Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. What are we supposed to do with that authority? We're supposed to use it to put it into operation, to stop the power of the enemy. Now, many people like to just quote the scripture and finish it out, and it says, And see, nothing shall by any means hurt me. I'm just going to confess nothing can hurt me, therefore it won't be able to hurt me because I declared it. Is that going to get the job done? No. How do we know? Because when we look at the word, nothing by any means hurts you, is that a statement of fact? No, it is not. How do we know? Because it is not in the mood, which is the factual mood, which is indicative. It is in the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things that are conditional upon conditions being met and contrary to fact. It's not a fact. Therefore, the fact that he's given you authority over all the power of the enemy, that's a fact. But the, fact, the point about nothing by any means hurting you is not a fact until conditions are met. And what are the conditions that need to be met? You need to arise with the authority delegated unto you and use that authority to stop the power of the enemy. Now you've got to understand, the devil has power. Don't think for a minute that the devil can't do anything. The devil has power and he has might. But it takes authority to stop the power and the might of the enemy. And God has given you that authority. So we must arise and use the authority delegated unto us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we also must know our weapons of warfare. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not of the physical, or the natural. They're not of anything that you can do in your own ability. No. They're mighty or powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They are spiritual weapons that are powerful and mighty that will conquer every attack of the enemy that would come against you. In this particular context, it's talking about to attacks that come against a person's mind, where it's talking about the imaginations and the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and evil thoughts that are coming where we're to cast down these evil thoughts. It works in the mental realm, in your mind. It works in every realm. You have spiritual weapons that are going to conquer all of the attacks of the enemy that would come against you in your life. Now, at the same time, you must understand the devil and his device, no, understand his devices. You cannot be ignorant of these things. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You cannot be ignorant of, of Satan's devices, otherwise he'll be able to deceive you and have an advantage over you if you don't know what he is doing and what he's up to. That's why we need to understand the workings of the devil. Some people don't want to talk about the devil. We don't want to talk about the devil. If you don't learn about the devil, how are you going to know how to deal with him when he comes at you? We got to know his wiles back in Ephesians 6.11 where it says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, all the tricks, the strategies of the devil. The devil has wiles and tricks and strategies, and you must know them, and you must be able to recognize them so that you do not fall for his tricks. Very important that we arise. Now, you also must realize that this is a spiritual battle. It says in Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Your battle is not against people. People might be used of the devil, but don't get your eyes on people. You must understand, it is the devil, the evil spirits that are working in conjunction with them or through them that are carrying out Satan's evil works. Our warfare is against the evil spirits that are operating. It is a spiritual warfare against spiritual enemies. Therefore, you and I must get armed with spiritual armor. And he says in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. The word strong is the Greek word endunimo, which means to be empowered within. 
You're to become empowered within, full of power on the inside of you, in the Lord, and in the power. This is a different word. When we talked about this word in the past, this is a word which refers to a power being manifested out of you or being released in the manifested power of His might or mighty force. Therefore, you're to have power within, resident in within you, and power manifesting out of you with mighty force. As you get the power of God resident in you through the Word in you is how you put the whole armor of God on, and then you release it out of you as you put your mouth in operation, beginning to war against those enemies as you pray prayers of authority against the enemy. Well, we've got to get ourselves armed. And as he says, we put on the whole armor of God. Putting on is a word which means to like sinking into clothing. It's like putting on clothes. Sinking into clothing or actually clothing yourself. And by the way, this is you, your responsibility and my responsibility. The reason we know this is because it is in the middle voice. Now there's three voices in the Greek. There is an active voice, which means the subject is doing the action. There is a passive voice, which means the subject is being acted upon by somebody else. But there's also the middle voice. The middle voice is the subject doing the action for himself. And that's what's used here. So when it says, put on or clothe yourself, literally it would say, you are to clothe yourself with the whole armor of God so that you are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You and I do this through the Word of God in our heart, the Word of God in our mind, the Word of God in our mouth, the Word of God directing our steps. God's Word is to be directing everything that you do in life. Now at the same time, you're going to have to realize that you're going to have to put off things that are not of the, of the Lord. We see over here in Romans chapter 13, in verse 12, it says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Get rid of all of the works of darkness in your life. Do not let anything of the enemy, of the world, of sin, anything uh, get, have a hold upon you. You cast those things off. Lay them aside. Put them off. And let us put on, this is that same word, and duo, put on the armor of light. It is light that is coming into you that is going to conquer the darkness, praise God. That's why it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ as you put the Word in you. You're putting on the new man, and you're getting His Word in you, and the light is coming into you. At the same time, don't make any provision or forethought, this means, for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. No, you are not going to be able to be successful if you try to deal with things and problems in life by fleshly means. And don't be one of those that tries the things of the Spirit for a moment and then goes back to the ways of the flesh. No. You can walk in the ways of the Spirit. You use spiritual weapons against spiritual enemies and you will conquer them and they will be destroyed and put underfoot in your life. If you are going to be able to possess a conquering warfare mentality, you must have courage. You cannot have fear in your life. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, be strong and of a good courage, as he's telling them what to do to go possess the land. He goes on in verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law. Can't be turning to the right or can't be turning to the left. Then he goes on in verse 9, and he says, if not, I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. You've got to know that God's on the inside of you. He's in you through the Holy Spirit. He's in you through the Word of God. He's in you through the Spirit of Christ. Greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. You are well able to overcome and to conquer every enemy and every attack that comes against you in your life. Well, we've got to decide that we are going to arise and we're going to get strong and we are going to get courageous and we're going to get into the fight. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 34 speaks of those in the faith chapter where they quench the violence of fire, they escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong or powered within, waxed valiant, this means mighty, mighty and forceful in fight, in the war, this refers to the battle, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. God wants you 
you've got to realize you're going to get mighty and force, mighty force within you in the war, in the battle, and you are going to have the power of God resident within you, and you're going to be able to conquer all the enemies against you in your life. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, down here in verse 13, he says this, Watch ye. We do have to be spiritually attentive, got to watch so you're not deceived by the enemy and you know what the enemy is up to. Stand fast in the faith. You got to be standing steadfast, can't be wavering, wondering, drawing back. Quit you like men. This is a word which means to be brave. To be brave. God wants you to be brave, to have courage, be ready to take on any attacks of the enemy. And to be strong. This means to be manifesting power and strength coming forth out of you in your life. It's going to take that if you're going to be able to possess a conquering warfare mentality. Because the battle is in the mind. The battle is against, that the devil brings against you, will be working in your mind to try to make you think that you can't conquer the enemy, or get you to have fear, or doubt, or any kind of negatives in your mind. Well, in Acts chapter 4, they had a prayer meeting. Down here in verse 31, he says, When they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. It is going to take boldness to uh, conquer the enemy and come against the enemy with boldness and courage and spiritual strength and power resident within you. You can overcome all of the enemies, and of course you have the authority that's been delegated unto you. Now at the same time, we're going to have to, as, as you get strong, and it's important that you really are working on increasing spiritual strength in your life, and this comes because of fruitfulness through the Word of God. In Psalms 104, it says in verse 24, He increased His people greatly. And what was the result? Made them stronger than their enemies. The more fruit that you have, the stronger you're going to be. We go from fruit to more fruit to much fruit, and you get to the more fruit stage as you go through the purging process in John 15. The more you get cleaned out and walk in the Word, the stronger you're going to get, the more fruit you get. And the more you come to the place of abiding in Him, you'll come to the place of producing much fruit and be the disciple of the Lord. He says the increase, the reason we know this is fruit, because the word increased is actually, if you look down in the lower window, it's the Hebrew word para, which means to bear fruit, to be fruitful. He caused his people to be fruitful greatly. That means a great amount of fruit. And that makes you stronger than your enemies. This is why we've got to be hearers and doers of the word consistently. As you hear and do and you hear and do, you're going to be bringing, bringing forth fruit and more fruit and much fruit. And as you pursue every enemy in your life and cast out all the devils and you get cleansed of all the things that are evil, you're going to be driving that out so that you can bring forth more fruit in your life. We see over in Joel, Joel chapter 2, in verse 11. The Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for He is strong or mighty that executes His word. Who's going to be strong and mighty? The one who's an executor or a doer of His word. Who's going to be the army of the Lord that's going to be mighty? The ones that are hearing and doing the word. In the measure that you are hearing and doing God's Word is the measure of your, the might coming into you, which is going to make you fit for the army of the Lord. And you're going to go forth and you're going to be doing great and mighty works in these last days. We also see how this is connected into the Word in 1 John chapter 2, verse 14, where it says this, I've written unto you fathers because you've known Him that's from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because you are strong. This is this Greek word, iskeros, which means mighty and forceful. You're going to be mighty and forceful, and the Word of God abides in you. And you have conquered or overcome, which really is the word nakao, which means to conquer and carry off the victory. You have conquered the wicked one. That is the testimony that we are all going to have. You are not going to let the enemy conquer you. You are going to conquer him. How is it going to happen? Because you're going to get mighty through the Word of God abiding in you. In the measure the Word's abiding in you is the measure that you become mighty and forceful for the Lord. And then, of course, your ability to conquer and overcome the enemy. This is why we must be hearers and doers of the Word of God. That is the key. This is why it's essential that you hear the Word, 
and then you take hold of it and you apply it in your life. Luke 6, 48, he says, He's like a man which built a house. He dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, and it could not shake it. Could not shake it. The word could. We've seen this word, iskoo, down below. It means the word for mighty and, power, and, and having force, mighty force. This attack that came against the house did not have mighty force to be able to shake it. Why? Because it had been founded on a rock. By the way, when it says was founded, this means to lay the foundation, if you notice in the lower window. To lay the foundation. The foundation had been laid. And we see that this was already an accomplished work when it's speaking this. Because this is in the pluperfect tense. The pluperfect tense is a Greek tense, not often used. It is one which speaks of past results. It's past tense. It's something that has already been accomplished in the past with results in the past. So this is why you would translate this as Luke, as, as Young's translates it, had been founded. That's the way you would translate this particular word. So it says, the reason why the attacks coming against that house, and that would be the devil attacking you, would have no mighty force to shake you is because you had been founded upon a rock. Well, how did that happen? We go back one verse, and he says, Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them. The consistent hear and doer of the Word of God in all areas is causing you to build your house, your spiritual house, on a rock. And the, all the attacks of the enemy that come against you will not be able to shake you when you have come to the place of having been already founded, had been founded upon a rock. That's why you've got to get founded on the rock now. If you think you're going to be able to get founded on the rock suddenly when the attack comes, it's not going to work. This doesn't mean at that moment in time of the attack. It means it's already been done in the past, which means you have to all have already been founded on a rock in order to be able to withstand the attacks of the enemy. That's why this is training time for you. This is time for learning, growing in knowledge, growing, putting on the whole armor of God, getting strong and getting mighty now, so that you will not only be able to conquer the enemies in your life as you drive them out, but you're going to be established so you'll be able to conquer every attack that comes against you in the future. Praise God. That's what God is wanting. You see, you've got to understand these things. You're going to possess a conquering warfare mentality. You're going to be able to walk in victory. We see in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians 4, 13. This is a highly misunderstood verse. It says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. This is kind of a catch-all statement everybody makes for whatever their problem is. Well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The word here for can, do, which translate that way, notice in the lower window, it's this word we've seen many times, iskoo which is the word which means mighty and forceful. And so what he's saying is, I am mighty and forceful for, for, forceful for all things through Christ, which, the word strengtheneth, is the word endunimo. If you notice from below, we've seen this word several times. This is the same word used when it's said in Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord, be empowered within in the Lord. That's what this is talking about. You will have mighty force for all things through Christ who is empowering you from within. And it's important to realize that you are to get empowered. And the word is in the present tense, which means ongoing action. Who is empowering you from within. How's that happen? Because you got the word in you. In other words, how's this verse going to work for you? It's only if you've been empowered within. Empowered within through the word of God within you. When you have the power of God resident within you, you can do with mighty force all things, anything that you need to handle, you'll be able to be successful. Most people have taken this, they just want to make it a catch-all. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and they think just by confessing this that everything will just miraculously happen. And then they wonder, well, I've been confessing that, and nothing's been happening. I wonder what's wrong. Well, it's because we haven't met the conditions. Without the power of God resident within us, in dunamo, He's the one that empowers us. How? By putting on the whole armor of God, by getting the Word in us, 
That's how we have the power in us. That's how we're going to have mighty force to be able to do all things. If you used to like to confess this and that kind of uh, took away your confession to uh, think you can do everything, well, we need to get rid of traditions of men because they haven't been the truth. Instead, get yourself full of the power and then realize I have all my mighty force to do everything that God wants me to do through the power of God that is resident within me, praise God. See, we've got to know the truth so we don't follow the traditions of men. Now, another thing, if you are going to be able to have a conquering warfare mentality, you've got to get full of the things of God. And what are the things we need to get full of? Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they were looking for these ones that they could point over the business of taking care of, of the widows uh, being, uh, being neglected in the daily ministration. And he said he looked out and he's looking for those who were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. God wants you to get full of the Holy Spirit and he wants to, you to get full of wisdom. And he also said here, they've chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost. So here we see one who's full of faith, one who's full of the Holy Ghost, one who is full of wisdom. God wants that for us in our life. And then we see down in verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and of power. Here, this is the word dunamis. So we see four things that are listed here. Those that are going to be full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith, full of power, and full of wisdom. How do we get full of the Holy Spirit? Well, we get full of the Holy Spirit by doing the things that cause the filling of the Holy Spirit in our life. In Ephesians chapter 5, over here in verse 18, it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled is in the present tense, denoting continuous, repeated action. Literally, it says, Be being filled with the Spirit continuously. And how do you do that? One of the ways is speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You're not only ministering to the Lord, but it's also ministering to you and bringing a filling of the Spirit at this very same time. Also, we already saw that scripture earlier, but we'll bring it up again in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. When they had time of prayer, they were praying. What was the result? They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. As you pray, you're going to bring a filling of the Holy Spirit. So how are you going to get to the, be a place of one who is full of the Holy Ghost? You're a person who praises and worships and, pra and prays. The more that you praise and worship God, the more that you pray, praying in tongues especially, it's going to bring a filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. How are we going to get full of power? We already talked about that. Through the Word in you by putting on the whole armor of God resident in you, the power of God is going to be resonant within you. How are we going to get full of faith? Well, we're going to get full of faith because we're going to put our faith in operation. First of all, of course, you've got to realize the fact that you have a spirit of faith that's been given to you when you were born again. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, We having the same spirit of faith. We all have the same spirit of faith because we have the same spirit of Christ. And what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put your spirit of faith in operation, work in your faith. I believe, therefore I speak. When you believe God's word, then you speak or act upon it. Speak it forth, act upon it, do what it says, which is putting your faith in operation. God wants your faith to grow and to become strong and mighty. Also, of course, you have a general spirit of faith, but then you need to hear the word that brings specific faith. You must understand, there's a difference between having the spirit of faith, which is what you have when you're born again, and then having faith from the Word, for faith for a promise of God that's been given to us. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says this, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So two things are important about faith. One, you have a general spirit of faith which you got from the day you're born again. Two, you get specific faith through hearing the Word of God on area after area after area. As you hear the Word, it produces faith in you. Now, as you, what are you supposed to do then? You've got to put your faith in operation. In Luke chapter 17, because we want to get full of faith. Luke 17, 5, The apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith, or 
cause our faith to grow strong or add to our faith. Get this faith to grow strong. Get, strong, get full of faith. And he told them what to do. Here was Jesus' answer. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, which we do as a seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Now why did he tell them that? He's essentially telling them, use the faith that you have and put it into operation. Apply your faith. How do you apply your faith? We believe, we speak. This is just one of the ways. You apply your faith by speaking the word or doing the word, acting on the word in some capacity. As you work your faith, then your faith is going to grow strong. If you don't work your faith, your faith will not grow strong. It's important that you understand, as it says in 2 Thessalonians 1.11, that your faith is to be worked. In fact, it says, he's praying for them in 2 Thessalonians 1.11, praying always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. You're going to work your faith with the power of God being released out of you, and you are going to put it into operation. Remember, that you get specific faith through hearing the Word of God. But, does that mean your faith is doing anything? No. James 2.20, Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works, if you're not working your faith, is dead. It's not doing anything for you whatsoever. Verse 22, Seeing how faith wrought with his works, by works was faith made perfect, or it came to completion and brought forth results. He says here that by works a man, see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. In other words, you're going to apply your faith. You are going to put your faith in operation. And so you're going to work your faith. And what's going to be the result? It is going to grow strong. Also, and then how do we get full of wisdom? You're going to get full of wisdom because you are going to be applying the knowledge of God that you get, hearing and doing it, and it will produce understanding and then wisdom in your life. You must understand that there's three things that the Word's going to produce as you're it's just bringing forth in your life. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowledge comes through revelation by the Holy Spirit, and as we get the precise and correct knowledge of God, which is what this word means, epigenosis, we get the precise, correct knowledge of God, exactly what it says, and then you begin to apply that and do that, he's going to impart spiritual understanding to you. As you continue in carrying out the doing of the word from knowledge and understanding, then it will produce wisdom in your life. Let's just give you an example. Let's say in the area of casting out demons. You hear the word on casting out demons. You gain spiritual knowledge of this, spiritual facts revealed by the Holy Spirit. But you haven't put it in operation yet, and you don't have spiritual understanding about how this works until you start doing it. Once you start acting upon it, and you start seeing how to cast out these demons, how these demons come out of you, what's, how they try to resist, and the things that are necessary to get these spirits coming out of you, you don't have understanding yet. You get spiritual understanding by acting upon the Word and applying it. Then, as you continue in the knowledge of God, and the spiritual understanding, continually working in deliverance in your own life and ministering to other people, what happens? God imparts spiritual wisdom to you. That you have wisdom, you know how to deal with situations because you have applied the knowledge and the understanding and gained wisdom. So, how are you going to get full of wisdom? By getting knowledge, applying it in your life to gain spiritual understanding, continuing in that consistently, so that God will impart spiritual wisdom unto you. So four things that we see that they had, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, full of power, and full of faith. You get in that range, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to be able to go forth and accomplish the great and mighty works, and you're going to possess a conquering warfare mentality and conquer the enemies. Another thing you're going to have to learn to do is you are going to have to be spiritually attentive and watch, watching the enemy. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you ne enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We've got to be watchful. In fact, it even says so over in 1 Peter in chapter 5 when it's speaking about who your adversary is, who is Satan, 
It says this, be sober, be vigilant, or be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We've got to be spiritually attentive, seeing what the enemy is up to. Always approach things from a spiritual standpoint, not trying to deal with it or figure it out in the natural. No, God wants us to be spiritually attentive, praise God. We see that if we will learn to watch and pray, and be spiritually attentive, then we'll be able to deal with every situation. 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, Watch thou in all things, everything. Endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of your ministry. You're going to have to be spiritually attentive if you're going to be successful in anything that you do. Otherwise, the devil will attack you, and of course, then he will be able to be successful to stop the works of God in your life. Another thing is, you must deal with sin. If you have sin in the camp, can you stand against your enemies? No, you will not be able to win your battle. This is why you must understand. Romans 6.11 says, Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin. You are dead to sin because you now are alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. How would you let it reign in your mortal body? If you obey the lusts of the flesh. That's why we crucify the flesh daily, and we do not give place to it. Also, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You can sin from your flesh, your body, but you can also sin in the soul realm, from your will, from your mind, even in your emotions and attitudes that you have in the soul realm. So you got to yield your members, all your faculties, which would be what you're hearing, what you're thinking upon, what you're speaking, everything, your mind, your thoughts, everything needs to be yielded unto the Lord. If you yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, it produces sin. But if you yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead, as members, your members as instruments of, right, of righteousness unto God, you're then going to see you're going to conquer the enemy. For sin shall not have dominion over you. It's not to have dominion over you whatsoever. He goes on and says, Know ye not to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, Whoever you yield yourself to obey, you yield your mind to obey the devil, you yield your emotions to yield to anything or, you know, choosing the wrong thing. His servants you are to whom you obey. Whoever you yield to, you're actually a servant of him, whether you realize it or not. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That means it's imperative that you and I yield our members of, in obedience to God's word. When we do that, we're yielding them unto God and unto righteousness. It's going to produce righteousness through the obedience of the word, and it will bring forth fruit unto holiness. And see, the more that you conquer sin and you get cleansed of all the things that are evil in your life, you are, that's also going to produce spiritual strength in you, which is going to enable you to have a conquering warfare mentality. See, you can't just decide in my mind I'm going to have a conquering warfare mentality. No, it's going to come forth from God's work in your life. It's not something that you can, a mind over matter kind of attitude, I'll just have this attitude, just from knowledge. No, it's all going to be produced through the working of the Word of God in your life. Look at the scripture, Job 17, 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. The more that your hand, you're being cleansed, the stronger and stronger that you're going to get spiritually. And what happens? You get more fruit. Remember the guy who's increased fruit greatly? He becomes stronger than his enemies. All of these factors are important if you're going to be able to possess a conquering warfare mentality. You also can't let anything that get on you that's going to weigh you down. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every weight, anything that would try to pull you down, well, pressures, stress, tension, this problem, that problem, circumstances, don't let anything weigh you down. You lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets you, if that's if you have some besetting sins that it seems hard to get rid of. And then we're to run with patience, steadfastness, the race that's set before us. We are going to run the race. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus, and we're going to conquer the enemies in our life. We're going to cast off everything that is not of the Lord. We also must keep our body in line. Remember, we already talked about crucifying our flesh. 
But we even see also in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, where he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain, it's the word catalambano, so you can take hold of the prize. You're going to run the race. Remember, we're running the race with steadfastness. We're running this ra spiritual race. Every man that strives for the mastery. Now, this particular word, strive for the mastery, is a Greek word, if you notice below, ganizomai, which means to contend with adversaries and also to fight. It is the same Greek word used for fight the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy 6.12. Therefore, every man that's going to strive for the mastery, that's contending with the adversaries, that's going to fight a good fight in order to win, he's got to be temperate in all things. Temperance means to be self-controlled. You cannot let your body run you. You cannot let desires of the flesh run you. You are to be temperate, self-controlled in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run. I'm running this race. Not as uncertainly. I know where I'm headed. I'm headed to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, to possess the promises of God, to conquer the enemies, to please the Lord, to bring forth fruit, to possess promises in my life, destroy the works of the devil, serve the Lord, carry out the ministry that God has for me. I'm running that race. So fight I, we're going to fight, not as one that beateth the air. Like we're, we're, are we hitting anything? What kind of a fight? A spiritual fight. And you are hitting the mark against the enemy as you are acting on the word. When you bind the devil, those devils will be bound. When you loose and untie their hold, they will be untied from their place of, hold, of, hold, of, of, the, of having someone bound. When you cast those demons out and you speak to them, you are working and throwing those demons out. When you resist the enemy's attacks, you will be successful in resisting him and he will flee from you. You have authority and you are to use your authority and you are to fight that spiritual fight. And you're not just beating the air. You are hitting the mark against the evil spirits that are working against you. But he also says something else. I keep under my body. Your body does not want to engage in spiritual warfare. Your body just wants to do whatever it wants to do. You'll never be able to develop a conquering warfare mentality if your body is kind of running you. He says, I keep under my body. And actually, this is like to box your body, like buffet your body, like even beat it black and blue. Now, it's not talking about literally doing that, but you must have that kind of an attitude. I'm going to keep this body in control. I am not going to let this body have one moment of getting out of order, <clears throat> but I'm going to bring it into subjection. <coughs> bring it into subjection means to lead away into slavery. In other words, my body is my slave. Your body's not telling you what to do. You're telling it what to do. Who's, who's the one that's the it that's, that's, that's uh, telling the body what to do? Your spirit. You are to be led by the spirit. You are walking by your spirit. That's the spirit of Jesus Christ that has come into you, and you now have the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in you is going to lead you in the proper way. So you're going to keep this body under. You're going to lead it into slavery lest that by any means when I preach to others, he even says, I myself should be a castaway, which means not approved or not standing the test. We didn't bring this scripture this morning when we talked about this, but this also refers to one reason why we wouldn't be approved, where we wouldn't be approved if we allow our body to run us. He said he could even be not approved and be a castaway before the Lord. So this is another important point. We're going to cast off all these weights. We're going to conquer all sin. We're going to be temperate. We're not going to let the enemy get a hold of us. This means that it is imperative that you get your body under control of the realm of the spirit. There's an interesting scripture here in 2 Samuel 3.1 that tells you something. It says there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Saul is a type of a man after the flesh. He's just run by his flesh, by his body. David is the type of a man after the spirit who's walking after the way of the spirit. As the spirit gets stronger and stronger, then the flesh will get weaker and weaker. 
If you allow the flesh, though, to continually be somewhat strong, you will not be able to become spiritually strong. You aren't going to be spiritually strong and the flesh spiritually, uh, physically strong, you know, at the same time. One's got to get weaker and the other is going to get stronger. So in the measure that you are conquering everything of the flesh and it gets weaker and weaker, you are going to get stronger and stronger. Now another thing that's important, you're going to have to learn to be steadfast in the midst of attacks that come against you. We see over in James chapter 1, in verse 2, he says that, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Or this word actually means to be enveloped in, in all these particular temptations. Fall means, it really means to be encompassed about by these diverse temptations. And this doesn't mean that you're automatically going to fall into them, because it's in the subjunctive mood that when you would fall into these temptations or that you've been compassed about. Otherwise, you don't have to fall for them. But if you do, this is talking about, count it a joy if you, a subjunctive mood, if you might fall or as you're encompassed about by all these temptations. In other words, we're not supposed to fall, but if we do, we still should count it all joy, knowing this, that the trying of our faith worketh patience. If you have given place to something of course, God will show you the way out of it by confessing the sin, repenting, and coming to the place of walking in the ways of the Word. But as you keep the joy of the Lord before you and understand that the trying or the test, the proving of your faith works patience. This word patience is hupomone, which means steadfastness and constancy. So what this is saying is the fact that when these attacks come against you, you keep joy, you keep a rejoicing spirit about you, and you must know that this is an attack against your faith, and it is to work steadfastness, which is in the area of the soul. Because where's the battleground? In the area of your mind. It's either going to come through your flesh, wanting to do what it wants, or through your mind, or a combination of both. You've got to keep your soul in order. That's why the mind renewed to the truth is so important, so you'll think on what the Word says, instead of thinking on what the enemy would try to bring you to. It's going to work steadfastness in the soul, and you let steadfastness have its perfect work, so you'll be perfect, entire, and you'll be wanting or lacking nothing, and you will come out victorious against the attacks of the enemy. Hebrews chapter 10 also tells us something. Verse 35, it says this, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence in the Word of God. You have need of patience, steadfastness in the area of the mind and the soul. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive or carry off the promise. In other words, you can't, don't cast away your confidence. You maintain it. You keep doing the word of God. After you've done that, as you're steadfast in the mind, you're being steadfast as you're carrying out the word, you're going to be able to receive and take hold of the promise and carry off the promise. So that's why it's very important. You've got to be steadfast. The battleground is in that mind. You let the devil get you to draw back and not continue in the fight. Are you going to be able to prevail over your enemies? No. That's why also, not only being steadfast in the mind, but you also need something else. And that is long-suffering in the face of circumstances that haven't changed yet, as you're in the process of working out your salvation. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, it says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience. Now this word patience is not hypomone. It is the word macrothumia, if you see it below. And this particular word means long-suffering. In fact, it's been translated long-suffering correctly 12 of the 14 times. Unfortunately, two times patience, which kind of muddies the water about what it really means. It's through faith and long-suffering they now inherit, doesn't mean it's an accomplished work here. It's present tense, meaning that it's a process that you're going through to, to inherit the promises. <laughs> As Young's brings it out, are inheriting the promises. That's the way you would translate that. So it's saying through faith and long suffering, you are inheriting the promises. What are you doing with your faith? Your faith's being applied destroy the enemies, to receive the promises of God as you're working your faith. 
What's long-suffering necessary for? That's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And you're to be long-suffering in the face of circumstances that haven't changed yet. You might be dealing with some difficult circumstances. Maybe you're dealing with things in your body, disease, maybe in your mind as you're bat battling things, maybe in your finances, maybe in, in relationships, whatever it might be, as you're working out your salvation. You must be long-suffering as your faith is applied to bring the promise because as your faith's at work, it just doesn't happen instantly. It's going to be a process of conquering the enemies and possessing the promises and seeing these come to pass. This is why you need to be long-suffering. That's not only in your own life, but also in dealing with people. Long-suffering towards them till they come to the place of repentance in their life as you are going forth to see the promises of God come to pass. This brings us to another point. We're going to have to have endurance. You're going to have to have endurance ready for the long haul. Otherwise, you don't just start out in the warfare and then you're ready to throw in the towel and try some other means. Oh, we'll try the way of the flesh for a while and see if that'll work. No, we're not going to do that. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to endure hardness. You're going to have to be able to deal with things that come against you. Hardships, attacks, whatever it is. You need to be able to stand against it. <coughs> Excuse me. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then he says also, No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life. You're not going to be very successful at spiritual warfare if you get entangled with all these other things. Don't let the things of this life pull you down. Get your eyes on what Jesus wants you to do. You are born from above, remember. You're an ambassador for Him. You're not just carrying out your life here and that's all that life consists of. This is just what you're walking out. You're working out your own salvation. You're proving yourself before God. You're getting empowered. You're conquering the enemy. You're working out your own salvation and seeing victory come in your life. And you're being used of the Lord to minister to other people. You've got to realize the affairs of this life are just going to pull you down. Don't let yourself get entangled with them more than what you have to do just for normal functioning. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You've been chosen to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. So you're going to have to arise up and be able to deal with the attacks. We even see another scripture over in Acts 14, 22 that says this. The last part of this verse says that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. As you are engaging in warfare, you're going to be entering into ruling and reigning over your enemies. But notice this. We must, through much tribulation, much pressure, enter, <clears throat> enter into the rule and the reign of God. That's because the enemy is going to attack you every step of the way. He's going to, you're going to have to conquer him if you're ever going to enter into ruling and reigning. Because every time you try to take a step forward in the things of God, the enemy will be there trying to hinder you. But you're going to keep going forward and blast the enemy out of the way. Cast him out of the way. Resist him. Speak to those mountains. Can, you know, drive them out, whatever it is. And as you do that, you're going to get strong and you're going to be full of power. You're going to be victorious over the enemy and you're going to see the enemy be driven back. Now, those people that aren't even moving forth in the things of God, you know, the enemy's already got them wrapped up. But don't think that once you begin to go forth in the things of God, that, oh boy, all this is coming against me. Maybe I shouldn't even try to do this. That's just the devil trying to block you from advancing in the things of God, whether it's working out your own salvation or serving Him or going forth to, to do something for the Lord in some aspect of ministry. There will be much pressure. Tribulation means pressure. Pressure will be coming, but you are going through the pressure and you are going to conquer the enemy. As you are engaging, you're going to get in the spiritual fight. We gave the scripture earlier, but 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, wherein thou art was called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You are going to fight the good fight of faith. You are going to contend with the adversary, and you're going to continue to war against him as long as it takes until that enemy is put underfoot in your life. At the same time, you've got to realize that this just isn't one fight, and then I'm going to go live my life in the flesh and do whatever I want to do. No. It's not that way. You are in a spiritual fight for life. If you, once you get free of the enemies in your life, you're going to be helping other people. 
There's going to be a fight. In fact, the devil will always be around to try to test you to see whether or not he can get through to you. Deuteronomy 2.24 tells us something. When he told them he gave Sihon, the Amorite, into the hand of the Israelites, he said the statement, he says, begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. That doesn't mean go in, smite him, he's done, and everything's all over, now go have a picnic after that. No. Can begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. That means this is going to be a process. This is going to be an ongoing dealing with enemies as I'm driving them out and destroying them. And that's exactly what we see. They went through those enemies, and there were more enemies, and they kept driving out the enemies. And we see this all summed up over in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 30. Exodus 23, verse 30. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased. And what's this word increase mean? It's the word para. Remember we saw this earlier about how it meant bear fruit in Psalms 105, verse 24. It says, little and little I'll drive them out from before thee until thou be fruitful and inherit the land. What comes first? Driving out the enemies. What comes second? Bringing, bringing forth fruit. What comes third? Possessing the inheritance, the inherited land, which is what? The promises of God. This is all a type of you casting out the devils. You're going to cast out the demons little by little in every area of your life. And it's going to produce fruit as you're walking in line with the Word. And then you're going to inherit your promised land. You are going to see the promises of God come to pass, praise God. And you're going to be not just only warring for yourself, but you're going to be warring for others. Look what it says about Epaphras in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who's one of you, a servant of Christ. He's just like any of us. He wasn't some special, uh, equipped, anointed, so-called person out there. He's just like every single one of us. Saluteth you always. He wasn't doing this once in a while. This is his lifestyle. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Now, what, kind, what was he doing here? When you put the cursor over the word laboring fervently, there's only one Greek word for these two words. And this is the Greek word. <clears throat> it's the word agonizomai. We've already seen this word twice. We saw the fact that this is the word which means to contend with adversaries and to fight. You and I are engaging in the spiritual warfare, and that's really what it's talking about. Always contending with the adversary, fighting for you in prayers. That meant, hey, this guy was a servant of Christ. We just don't work out our own salvation. We're going to engage in the warfare to help other people. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So you are in warfare for life. Welcome to the army of God. <clears throat> you need to decide, I'm in the army. Don't sit there and think that I'll just get in the fight for a little bit and then I'll go and, and live my own life. It doesn't work that way. You are enlisted in the army of God for life the day you got born again, whether you realize it or not. You are in the army of the Lord, and you are going to be fighting that good fight of faith and destroying the works of the enemy. Praise God. Now, another thing that's important if you're going to possess a conquering warfare mentality, we need our mouth to work for us, and we need to have our mouth in operation. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, in verse 9, we see Eleazar, after Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Aohite, one of the three mighty men with David, they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. Here Eleazar is all by himself to deal with these Philistines. What did he do? He arose and he smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. What did he smite them with? The sword. And what is the sword? In Ephesians 6, 17, the sword is the the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is, in fact, we can jump back there just for a second. You must understand that when the sword is in hand, spiritually speaking, it is because the Word is coming forth out of your mouth. Your mouth is working. We know this because it says the sword of the Spirit, spiritual sword smiting the enemy, which is the Word of God. Now, there's two words for word. One word for word is logos. This is not logos. This is rhema. Rhema means that which is spoken or uttered, which means 
the spoken word of God or something that is being spoken or uttered forth. So what we see that when you have the sword in hand, your mouth is an operation. The sword is not just having, carrying your Bible around, you know, and thinking that I got my sword with me. Well, you got that which you put in your, the words of God, that you put them in your mouth, then the sword will be in operation. In other words, his hand, it says he smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. How do we smite our enemies? With our mouth. You keep your mouth going. You keep casting out. You keep praying. You keep resisting. You keep attacking the enemy and speaking forth what he says, what God says. And it says his hand clave under the sword. He, that means he never let his sword go down, which means your mouth always is continually working, speaking forth. His hand clave under the sword. He kept smiting him. And what happened? The Lord wrought a great victory that day. That's what will happen for you if you will engage in the warfare, continually smiting the enemies, praise God. Now, another thing that's important, Exodus 23, you've got to put your angels in operation. Exodus chapter 23, it speaks here in verse 20, how he spent, sends an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, to bring thee in the place that I prepared. And he says, Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he'll not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. If thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, I'll be an enemy to thy enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto all of the ites. Notice, the angels are going to bring you in against all of your spiritual enemies. And you're going to come against them. Otherwise, they're not going to lead you away from them. The angels of God that go forth to minister for us the heirs of salvation are going to bring you in up against every spiritual enemy in your life. Here it's talking about the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites. In other words, he's not going to lead you away from the devils. He's going to lead you right to come against them and confront them and deal with every spirit that is arrayed against you in any capacity. You're going to put these angels in operation and they're going to work on your behalf. Another thing that's important for having a conquering warfare mentality is in the face of circumstances that may have come against you which are not pleasing, you need to always encourage yourself in the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, here's where David and his men came to Ziglag and the Malachites had invaded and they burnt the place with fire. <clears throat> it says down here, they took the women captives. So when they came to the city, their wives, their sons, their daughters were taken captives. Here the enemy had come in and done some damage and took, some, took their family away. Well, of course, they were all upset and people were so distressed they even spoke about stoning David. But notice what David did. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Have you had a negative report? Have you had evil things come against you? Don't let yourself get discouraged. Discouragement means a loss of courage. Instead, encourage. In means in. Take courage in. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That's important. And what did he do? He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, said, Pursue, for I sh you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. What's the devil stolen from you? You don't have to sit there and think that it's gone forever. God says, Pursue, you shall overtake them, Without fail, you shall recover all. You can recover everything that the enemy has stolen from you. So you've got to encourage yourself in the face of circumstances. You let yourself get discouraged, you aren't going to enter in and possess the, the, the victory whatsoever. Now you also got to get on the offensive, of course. If you're going to get on the offensive, you're going to get into that spiritual fight. Over in Leviticus chapter 26, we see over here in verse 7, he says, you shall chase your enemies. Now, the word chase means to run after with hostile intent, literally. To pursue after or run after with hostile intent. You're going to chase after your enemies. They're going to fall you by, fall for you by the sword because you use your mouth. The sword is an operation when your mouth's an operation, smiting the enemies. You're going to chase them and put them underfoot. He says, five of you will chase a hundred, hundred you will put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. There's going to be a lot of fighting in war. 
I'll respect unto you, I'll make you fruitful, multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. So you're going to have to get on the offensive after the enemies. In fact, we see a scripture over in 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel 22, verse 38. He says this. <clears throat> this is David's psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance from his enemies. He says, I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them and turned not again till I consumed them. Otherwise, he went after his enemies, he kept pursuing them, and he didn't stop until they're underfoot. We're going to keep casting out the demons. We're going to go after every evil spirit that's come into us from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization. We're going to cast them out continually until we drive them out of every area of our life. We're going to go after everything that's trying to hinder us, and we're going to drive them all out. We're not going to stop until they're all consumed and smitten. I've consumed them and wounded them, but they could not arise. Yea, they're fallen under my feet. For you have girded me with strength to battle them that rose up against me. Hast thou subdued under me? Thou hast given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. So you've got to understand, the devils hate you. They hate you. They want to destroy you. They want to stop the things of God. They want to bring sickness, disease, poverty, all kinds of hindrances, destruction. You've got to get, turn the tables on them and destroy the enemies in your life. You've got to get after them. And you're going to use force and violence to come in, to press in to see victory come forth. Another point for you to have a conquering warfare mentality, you've got to get this attitude about you. Luke 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. What's the kingdom of God? The rule and the reign of God. And every man, that's every one of us, presseth into it. The word presseth means to use force or violence. It's the word biazzo, to use force or inflict violence upon you are going to use spiritual force and violence through the authority and the power of God coming against the enemy. Otherwise, you're going to engage in this warfare. Every man is going to use this force and violence to conquer the enemy and to see him be put underfoot in your life. That's what it's going to take. You're going to come against these enemies and you're going to drive them all out. You're going to destroy them all until they're put underfoot. We see something else. It's your responsibility to cast out all the devils, to drive every enemy out. If you don't do it, then you're going to stay in bondage in your life. Numbers 33, 52. It says, you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. It's a type you casting all the spirits out of you to possess the promises of God. And he goes on and he says, you shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land, dwell in, for I've given you the land to possess it. Otherwise, they're not supposed to abide in you. You're to cast them all out and destroy them. Then he goes on in verse 55. If you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes, thorns in your sides, shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. What's that tell you? If you don't drive them out, from God's perspective, you let them remain. Because God's given you authority. He told you to cast them out. You can't say, well, I wonder why God didn't cast them all out. It was because you didn't cast them out. As you cast them out, he casts them out. And he says, there'll be pricks in your eyes, thorns in your sides, and they'll vex you in the land wherein you dwell. The majority of all the Christians out there, they're born again, and they're all being vexed by the evil spirits that are in them, come in from inheritance, their own sins and victimization, and they're wondering why they're having all these problems. And they think, well, I guess it must be God. No, it's not God, it's the devil. Well, maybe God wants me to ha put, put up with this, to go through this, maybe to teach me something. No, he teaches you through the word. This is the devil trying to bring destruction against you, stealing, killing, and destroying in some aspect of your life. God's not involved with it whatsoever. It's the devil who's attacking. Who comes to steal, kill, and destroy? The enemy does. Jesus comes to bring life, and life more abundantly. We've got to get after these enemies and drive them out. And don't let this be something that you just kind of dilly-dally around and you're not consistent with. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 3, he says, Understand this day, the Lord thy God is he which goeth before thee. As a consuming fire he will destroy them. He'll bring them down before thy face so that thou shalt drive them out and destroy them quickly. He's going to destroy your enemies speedily. How fast will that be? As fast as you do the work. Otherwise, God's not slack concerning his promise. As you engage in the warfare, he's engaging in the warfare. 
As you cast out the devils, he's casting them out. As you speak to those mountains, he's speaking to those mountains. As you confront the enemy, he is confronting the enemy. And he will do it speedily. He will go into operation and you will see that the enemies will be conquered and put underfoot in your life. Praise God. What's going to happen as you drive these enemies out? Well, we see over in 1 Samuel chapter 7, in verse 13 and 14. He says this, The Philistines were subdued. That meant they were put underfoot. They came no more into the coast of Israel. They weren't bothering them anymore. The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. That meant God would be against those enemies. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel, those are the areas of your life where the enemies come in and possess some bond, areas of bondage in your life. They were restored. God's going to bring restoration to you. He's going to restore your health, restore you mentally, restore you financially, restore you in all the things the enemy's stolen. From Ekron into Gath, the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the, of the Philistines. You're going to get delivered. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. God will bring peace. You know, the Bible says, when the man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies will be at peace. Because you're, when, how are you going to please the Lord? You're going to smite them all and drive them all out. You're going to see them put underfoot. And you are going to conquer them. Now, will God conquer all your enemies? Maybe he'll, you know, maybe he doesn't want to conquer them all because maybe he wants to let you have a few stay in you just to, kind of keep you humble or whatever. No, that's a religious tradition. It's a lie. He says this, Since that time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, in 1 Chronicles 17.10, moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. All means all. We're going to drive them all out. We're going to cast them all out. And we're going to see God bring forth victory. At the same time, you got to make this battle as strong as is necessary. Some people kind of fight it at a certain level, but then they just don't really increase the fight to conquer the enemy. 2 Samuel 11:25, we see this statement. He says, make the battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage thou him. Problem was, they were fighting, but they hadn't gotten the victory yet. What did he say? Make the battle more strong. If you're casting out a little bit, well, cast out more. If you're praying and resisting the enemy and interceding a little bit, step it up and start coming against these enemies. Put forth more power and might and spiritual force to destroy the enemies. Make the battle more strong. Take it to the enemy. Do whatever you need to do in order to see the enemies be put underfoot in your life. And you will see that God will give you the victory. One last scripture. Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. This is what God promises that he will do if you will fight that fight. The God of peace shall bruise or break in pieces, crush and break in pieces, Satan under your feet. He's putting him under your feet because you're the one who's going to fight the fight. And as you fight, he fights. And it says shortly. Well, how fast is shortly? How much time? It really doesn't mean shortly as far as talking about a period of time. This particular word, there's two words here you have to go down below, is the word tacos, which means with quickness and with speed. This literally means speedily. God of, the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet with quickness and with speed. Now again, how long is that going to happen? How, long is, is that, how fast will that be? As fast as you are engaging in the warfare. As you drive them out, he will drive them out. And that's what God wants us to do. As we get these things established in us, we are going to possess a conquering warfare mentality. You're going to get this warfare mentality. You're going to be taught, trained. You're going to be prepared. You're going to know your fact that you're more than a conqueror. You're going to know your authority. You're going to know your weapons. You're going to rise up and go forth with the authority and speak in the name of Jesus to cast out the demons. You're going to know the enemy's tactics. You can't be ignorant of his devices. You know you've got a spiritual battle against spiritual enemies. You're going to get armed with the armor of God. You're going to be bold and strong and courageous. And you are going to go forth and conquer the enemies. And you're going to get strong and courageous and, and or spiritually strengthened as you bring forth 
fruit in your life. As you get a great amount of fruit, you will become stronger than your enemies, as we saw. You're going to also get full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, full of power, and full of faith through prayer, praise and worship, hearing the Word, doing the Word, applying the Word, working your faith, walking according to the knowledge of God, gaining spiritual understanding and wisdom. As you do this, you're going to be a dynamo for the Lord. And you're going to watch spiritually. You're going to conquer all sin. You're going to cast out every, off every weight. You're going to keep your body under so you're not a castaway. You'll be steadfast in your mind, temperate in your body. You're going to be long-suffering in spirit. You're going to be enduring in the face of the attacks. You're going to be engaging in the warfare, fighting that fight against the enemies, knowing it's a process of driving them out. You're going to keep your sword in hand, which is your mouth in operation, attacking the enemy. You're going to know the angels are going to go into operation for you that are going to fight against those enemies. And you're going to encourage yourself in the Lord. You're going to get on the offensive and chase those enemies, and you're not going to stop until they're put underfoot. You're going to use force and violence to press in until the enemies are put out. And you're going to drive them all out with quickness and with speed, praise God. You're going to make the battle as strong as is necessary. The result is you're going to get delivered, you're going to get restored, you're going to get healed. You're going to restore, see everything that the enemy has stolen be recovered. You're going to pursue them all and you are going to recover without fail, recovering all. As you subdue all the enemies underfoot, you're going to see that the God of peace is going to crush Satan under your foot speedily, and you are going to possess the promises of God in your life, and you're also going to help others get set free. Casting out demons, spiritual warfare of intercession, using your spiritual weapons and your authority is going to be a lifelong activity for you as a soldier in the army of the Lord. You're going to endure hardness in, against the attacks at the same time, but you're going to go through that. And the more stronger you get, you're going to come to the place where you're going to be, the enemies will even be at peace with you because you'll be a mighty dynamo full of power, full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of might, full of all the things that God wants, and you're going to see victory come forth. Say this to me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for the principles in your word that reveals how to possess a conquering warfare mentality. I will put these principles into operation in my life and I will possess a conquering warfare mentality. I will maintain this mentality and I'll be ready to deal with anything and everything that comes against me. I will stay on the offensive and I will destroy all the enemies. As I do the word, you do the word. As I war, you war. As I fight, you will fight. And I will see you, the God of peace, crush Satan under my feet with speed and quickness. And I thank you, Lord, for all the victories you've already given me, and I'm going to continue in the fight, pursuing the enemies, and I will see every enemy be put under my foot. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You take these principles, these are going to be life principles for you. Do them. Watch God bring forth great things in your life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, as we close, glad to pray for anybody that has any areas of particular need. If you haven't been involved in deliverance, we want to encourage you. Make an appointment with me. I want to sit down and talk to you about the problem areas of your life and a confidential appointment. Begin to minister deliverance and begin to cast out those spirits. Don't let the enemies keep you from getting involved in deliverance. Jesus said, the first sign following the believer is these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. If we're not doing it, we're not advancing on getting these enemies out. Therefore, we need to get ourselves started. If you haven't gotten started, come up, we'll make an appointment, we'll get started on casting out these spirits, we'll start driving them out, and we'll start to see God bring forth victory in your life. If you don't cast them out, they're going to keep working at you. And you better, they aren't leaving until you confront them and drive them out. God's given you authority to destroy the works of the enemy. 
Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We're going to be hearers and doers of your word, and we will possess this warfare conquering mentality all the days of our life, and we will go forth and gain the victory and see great works being done, not only in our life, but through us. Father, thank you that we are a part of the army of the Lord.